who I am. I was trained by Al Gore after I saw his movie to give a speech, a talk based upon his slide set, and I've been doing that for the past two years on three continents. I'm here because I came to Poland to attend the United Nations Conference on Climate Change uh, the first two weeks in December. Unfortunately, there was a failure of that conference to make any meaningful progress. Um, it was dreadful for all of us who were there as ecologists and not as uh, uh, industrial interests. Unfortunately, again, the deadline is December of 2009 for a definitive treaty to cap greenhouse gas emissions or we face a very bleak future. That future is not directly in our sight, but we can see that it's coming if we if we extrapolate on the, the patterns that our ecosystem is taking now. And the other conclusion is that the governments of the world will not be able to take action in time. They will not solve it if we don't do something. And this project that I have in mind is dedicated to moving those governments along. Now I have four axioms that I would like to present to you. First, first that life on Earth is in mortal danger. You've heard a lot of these facts in little bits and pieces. You've seen movies here and there and things on t TV. Let me give you the statement by a body of 2,500 very conservative scientists who stated at the end of 2007 that global CO2 emissions must peak by 2015 and decline rapidly to avoid catastrophic changes in Earth's climate that may lead to the extinction of 20 to 30 percent of all species by the end of this century, the end of this century alone, and threaten human survival. Another quotation from someone you probably know, Stephen Hawking, who is afraid that the Earth might end up like Venus at 250 degrees centigrade raining sulfuric acid. This is not light stuff. James Hansen, uh, the head of NASA, NASA's Goddard Space Flight uh, Agency in, in uh, America, who's been saying this for 30 years, the climate system is dangerously close to tipping points with disastrous consequences for young, for life, and for the general well-being of the planet. And in particular, we risk returning the planet to ice-free conditions when sea levels were higher by 70 meters. Incidentally, Berlin is about 45 meters above sea level. And about one-third of Germany lies under 70 meters of sea level. Now, just to give you a few of the catastrophic events, these are, are, are all possible failure modes for the ecosystem for life on the planet. Any one of these could doom us. And if that's not enough, I'm sorry I don't have enough time to let you read all of those 20. Business and politics are not helping. That's the second principle. That should be patently obvious to this audience especially. Third, that public outcry can and has in the past brought down walls. And last, that the hackers of the world can wake the world. I'm looking for a few good people to help with this project. It's estimated that one out of six people on Earth have access to the Internet. This will be an important channel for the eco-political social engineering, which this project that I will propose will be. I won't discuss it. I don't have time now. Anyone who responds to my email address, which is on my final slide, will get the, the straight scoop on it. I view hackers as the key masters of the internet, and you have little to lose but your time. But there is really no time to lose. So please, if you're motivated to, if you hear, hear the calling, please email me at this. I've already reserved the Hackers for Earth domains in the .com and .org, um, which will be populated as part of the, the project, but that is not the project. The project Again, I call it socio-political, excuse me, eco-political social engineering. So, thank you very much. So, the next.
Okay, coming up, Mark Bergman, about fish marks, a combination of fishing and bookmarks. I hope I didn't take too much away. <laughs> here you go. Welcome, everyone. Well, actually, the idea to, uh, to stand here was, uh, was born only a day ago. And I saw there was an empty, empty slot, so I uh, immediately wrote myself in. Now, who am I? I'm Mark Bergman. Some people might know, might know me by my nickname, Sea Chicks. Most of you might not know me at all. Uh, why I'm uh, going to give this lightning talk? Well, I found something that looks pretty odd, and I don't really have time to sort it all out myself. So maybe there's someone else willing to dive a little bit deeper into it. Well, how it works, kind of simple. Internet Explorer and actually Firefox as well seem to prefer bookmarks above DNS lookups. Which means if you type www.google.com in your browser, you expect to end up at, at Google, which will of course happen, unless there's a bookmark with the name www.google.com. And the URL of this is set to yahoo.com. So the only thing you need to make, the only thing you need is a bookmark with the right name. And of course you don't want to fish Google, or well maybe you will, but it might be especially interesting for banks. Well this is a screenshot of, uh, of uh, a bookmark in Internet Explorer. No hassle there. In Firefox there's still the load this bookmark in the sidebar thingy that, that's on by default. If you make a bookmark um, from a JavaScript, it can only be added to a side panel. I'm still looking for better JavaScript to make real bookmarks, but I think that's only little technical issues and it probably will be solved. Also in um, Firefox, it actually gives away the trick because you see a, a, a pop down from your URL bar stating the real URL as well. So that's a bit nifty, but uh, in Internet Explorer it works, works uh, flawlessly. Well, some thoughts on what to do with this. Well, of course, www.bank.com, you could point that to HTTPS double dot slash slash well www.bank.com and then your own evil site and of course you give this a, a, a you start with a, a lot of well rubbish characters to make people think it's a normal site and well you can actually have that site uh, make that site uh, having a valid uh, SSL certificate so guess what the little thingy that everyone has to check according to their banks will be closed and the site will seem perfectly safe well, what would, do we need to get this working? We need a, wee, we need a way to make uh, bookmarks as easy as possible. So JavaScripting or maybe some other uh, way to, to trick people into clicking OK, which in the past has been proven not to be very hard. Maybe clickjacking is a good start for this. Uh, we'll still have to sort out how to fix the, the sidebar issue. So how to make sure that in Firefox uh, uh, the, the bookmark will load a full screen. Also, I haven't had any time to check uh, other browsers, but I'm getting curious what Chrome, uh, Safari, and all the other browsers will do. I'll be diving into this maybe for, uh, for a few more minutes, but if other people feel interested and uh, have, have time to sort this out, well, it won't even cost that much time, send me a mail and, um, well, good luck diving into this. My, my email address, uh, you can find some more information on the wiki. So I'm more than happy to hear from you, and thank you for your time. Okay, thanks, Mark. Next one is Mario. He talks about the Freiphone community, which is a wireless radio community. And after that, we hear Marcel. Hi, um, I'm Mario. I'm um, supporting the Freiphone communities um, already for a few years. Um, I, I don't know, many Germans, I think most Germans know what Freifunk is. Um, uh, you could translate that uh, as uh, free wireless. 
and um, we actually want to um, transfer the idea of free and open source um, uh, software to infrastructure. So what we do is uh, we have uh, OpenWRT and other um, firmwares that we use and actually we um, connect people uh, through mesh networks. So um, there are, for instance, uh, people who have uh, connection to internet and other people who don't. Well, I don't have connection to the people who have internet, so I can go through another person in the middle, an intermediate. So uh, that's, for instance, one case where we can use Freifunk. But Freifunk is not about just about sharing internet. It's a lot about um, uh, like sharing it all and learning about technology, many things. So. I don't want to talk so much about Freifunk because we have all heard about this uh, maybe before or about similar projects. What I was interested in now uh, is um, uh, what's going on internationally with Freifunk. So I uh, did research and I set up this uh, website and the website is actually called uh, um, global.freifunk.net and um, yeah it's here and I found a lot of people all over the world who share this idea and that's fantastic to me um, so um, I'm actually collecting all the feeds of uh, um, communities that offer uh, Freifunk feeds and um, I found about uh, 220 communities um, mainly in, like, um, in the like, Western language speaking world, it's very hard for me to find uh, Chinese speaking and so on. So Asia is uh, still somewhat um, underrepresented. But uh, already uh, more than 150 uh, communities offer and feed and I collect these feeds and um, show them on my website. So there is a kind of um, a, a global newswire. And uh, what I would like to do here is, uh, because we have people from all over the world here, um, please join me, you know projects, um, please email a project to me, uh, let me know about uh, any uh, project that's going on. Um, as I said, we started with the free wireless thing, so it's not only about open source software, um, we have this idea expanding to open hardware. Um, I met uh, open pattern guys here, uh, Xavier Cassel from uh, France, he had a presentation at the um, Congress, uh, so uh, it's not about open source, uh, open wireless only, it's all about, uh, also about um, open hardware. Um, yeah, if you know any project, please uh, mail me and I would like to include this uh, in uh, the global uh, newswire and um, yeah, promote uh, the idea of um, free and open uh, knowledge and uh, sharing um, everywhere. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mario. That was only three minutes, so you gave us one minute. Oh, I just, um, so here's my email address, of course. Okay, so if anyone uh, is wondering, uh, and of course you find my contact details uh, on the wiki as well. Uh, let me know your website, if and I include it in the newswire. Uh, uh, yeah. The next speaker is Marcel. He talks about Agile Admin. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I would like to talk about Agile Way for sysadmins. Agile becomes more and more yeah, common in software development, like test-driven and something like that. In 2006, I wrote an essay about, um, and I analyzed how to uh, adapt or how to transfer the knowledge of Crystal, Scrum, and extreme programming, or special test-driven development. Um, to system administration. So agile values, principles, and practices, and try to, yeah, how, how we can use this at uh, system administrators, so what was my job at this time. And yeah, I call this um, agile system administration. And if we are looking for that, it's not just a transfer of knowledge, it's also a, yeah, a search for the best practices for sysadmins, and that's what I would like to discuss, or would like to find people who would like to, um, search for nice practices and I want to introduce you um, a couple of ideas that um, may be quite common or known. Uh, for example, if ever someone hears first time about um, extreme programming, if, oh, that's pair programming, yeah, I know, to sitting two people in front of a keyboard, driver, co-driver, writing a test and then implementing the stuff. Um, but it's not that all. This is the same in system administration. If you have a time problem, time based um, issue, yeah, two people in front of a keyboard, I, of course, yeah, I do that. Um, if we are thinking about self organized teams, um, 
it's quite useful to learn something, so to have a look back in the past and yeah, to use your retrospectives. And if you're working in self-organized teams, you um, need some values to, to think about how, how that can work. And um, they're not my ideas, so the USENIX, which is a subgroup of um, the SAGE, sage.org, um, introduced the code of ethics for sysadmins, which is um, uh, some rules, it's like 10 rules or so, to how, how you can work. And yeah, for me, it's, I, get, I get very into uh, tests, writing tests in a in, in, um, network environment like Nagios. What is it in English? Nagios. <laughs> and yes, in this way, I like this test stuff and to, to um, stop writing every paper documentation, which is just crap. Um, this is the idea of agile development as well. Like you have just tests and that is your documentation. Um, so, and there are other way I, I wrote responsibility on my slide. This means like um, if you if you have to uh, hold the system running or the network running, I want to make the decision how that could work or uh, which uh, technical which which which, which technique we um, yeah choose to to solve the problem. And I don't want to discuss quality. So this is XP as well. Like um, I want to be um, yeah I want to be. Uh, um, like what I've done, so um, I want to make it secure and to make it fail-proof and make it tested and to be sure that it's it's um, it's okay. So, um, if you're interested in stuff like this, I've re um, recorded in 2006. It's quite um, a time ago, <laughs> a podcast with uh, a friend of mine, Basti, and it's it's in German, but it's um, it's about extreme administrating, which was the first title, but it's this title is. Sh um, not so good, okay? And um, yeah, have a look at the code of ethics from Sage. And um, I like these ideas, and I would like to find people who are interested in uh, setting up a domain, setting up a wiki, and um, yeah, collecting ideas. Thank you very much. So, thanks, Marcel for presenting us Agile Admin. Next speaker is Briggs. He talks about Energize. Um, yeah, the microphone is yours. OK, thanks. Welcome here. First, let me ask you a question. Hmm? Can you imagine what this might be? Or why I might, might put it here? Right, we don't have so much time, so it's a scale and it's balancing two things. The data centers in the world and the Netherlands. Now, why do I balance those? They are quite comparable in CO2 footprint. Millions of tons of CO2 emissions per year. The data centers in the world are, at best estimate, 170 million tons of CO2 per year. Now. If you compare this to a country like the Netherlands, 146 million tons of CO2. Now, this is a big number, right? So, I'm making three key points here. Computers use a tremendous amount of energy. We can do something about it. And this something usually pays for itself. As I said, computers use much energy. 16 million people, highly industrialized country, top 10 in gross domestic product in the Netherlands, and all these tomato greenhouses and what have you, uses less energy than the data centers. Oops. Or in another figure, the data centers use about the same energy as all the airlines together, half of the, all the airlines together. And yes, we can do something about it. Infrastructure matters in data centers can bring us a 10 to 20% reduction in that figure. You can make the cold aisles in the data center between the racks hotter. You can use natural cooling, what we in technical terms call open a window. Um, here in the moderate climates, we can do that. Um, we can use better computers. This is what 
Sun and uh, IBM and so on tell us as the biggest, be uh, best solution to the problem, use better computers, greener, more efficient servers, gives you a 20 to 20 percent reduction overall, which is a lot. But we can do more. We can do better management. And this is not going to cost you a lot of things. It's, it's actually not costing money, it's saving money. Shutting off dead servers, servers that, that don't do anything anymore, just nobody dares to shut them off because nobody knows for sure. Okay. 10 to 25 percent reduction. Use virtualization, aggressive virtualization, 25 to 30 percent. Install capacity when you need it and not earlier. Normally you buy a server for three years. So you buy the capacity that you expect it to need in three years and then some. Now this is of course buying too much capacity too early. With virtual machines you can do this very much smoother. Gives you 10 to 20 percent reduction. So we can reduce something like 50% of the energy consumption in the data centers. It's good for the planet. It goods, it's good for the bottom line. So for the management people, they like that. And we save money by that. So less hardware costs, less infrastructure, less running costs, very good return on investment. So let's tip the scales here. Thank you for your time. Here I quote my sources. The PDF is on the web, um, it's, it's on the wiki uh, and uh, probably will be published somewhere. My contact details, if you want to know more or want to discuss things, thank you. So that was clean for, for minutes, so perfect on time. Next one is Michael and he talks about mapping. Yes, okay, everything's working. Okay, I want to pitch scalable vector graphics to you. That's an XML standard that you're probably familiar from illustrations in Wikipedia or the icons in KDE. I use it for uh, mapping election results uh, uh, on the web. So usually uh, in mainstream media, you find these election maps that are done in Flash, and Flash is proprietary, is closed, and yada, yada, yada. And um, you cannot uh, put your data in, and it's always a good idea to be in control of your tools. And so I built an uh, election atlas using scalable vector graphics, and uh, you can just view source, uh, put different data in it, and I will show you why it might be worth uh, doing this. This will work on the iPhone. Um, this will work on the $100 uh, dollar, uh, per child. And um, it even works on this Windows machine. So, um, um, I wanted to show you, oops. Um, I mean, this is, the Conservative Party, I mean, you have seen that, but let me show you something about the Nazi Party in Germany. This is the 2002 election. You will see uh, some pockets here in Saxony, um, but it's still, I mean, the darker the colors, the higher uh, the percentage, uh, the, the higher the popularity, but we are still um, uh, far below 5%, uh, even below 3%. Now, um, to give you some idea how this developed, um, if we look at the 2005 election, and again, NPD is the Nazi party here, and so, yeah, this is the same scale uh, we are now here up to 7% and um, 
We can also um, uh, try to gain some more insights um, when we um, look at some structural data. So, I will show you a map with a percentage of uh, foreigners. And again, the darker colors mean high percentage of foreigners. And I think the picture is quite clear that a xenophobic party is more popular in areas where there are no foreigners and is less popular in areas where there are a lot of foreigners. Just keep that in mind. Um, you, can, you can check this out. Oops, sorry. Um, there are, there's a lot of data in there already. Um, oops, sorry about that. So, this is my last slide. Um, you can check it out at this um, URL. Uh, there will be elections in Germany in June, the European election in September, the general election, and um, you can check this out. And also, maybe you will be interested in how the Pirate Party uh, will do, and you will not see that probably in Spiegel Online, uh, but you will probably see it here. Thank you. Manfred, come, please come to the stage. So. Braucht ihr die PowerPoint oder reicht auch PDF? Na, dann mach. One, two, oh yeah. <laughs> Good evening. We would like to introduce to you the Netwatcher, a part of uh, free radios in uh, German language. Uh, but for all who does not understand German, I'm here uh, to tell uh, the people what is uh, with this camera there. Uh, there are cameras over there and over there uh, which are uh, filming us to the face for this. We have the black bars. Oh yeah, we have the black bars in front of our face because there are lots of cameras there for the live stream. This camera is for you, for your security. I hope you feel more comfortable and uh, secure because this camera faces you. Okay, thank you. It is of course not running, okay. So, let's talk about uh, Netwatcher and free radios. Yes, uh, we are from... This okay, this talk will be in German because we're talking about uh, German language radio, free radio, radio Netwatcher. So, um, wir haben also in den letzten drei Jahren uh, jede Woche eine Sendung gemacht und haben also so einige Knacker in den Über... Uh, in den Schlagzeilen gehabt, die wir gemacht haben. In unserem äh, Radio geht es hauptsächlich eben, wie unten schon gesehen, um Privacy-Radio, hauptsächlich um gesellschaftliche Themen und dergleichen. Und die Dinge, die wir eben halt gemacht haben, ist, äh, der Manfred hatte ein Interview, als es ihn noch gab, äh, mit Jörg Haider gehabt. Und er hat sich dort ganz eindeutig gegen Überwachung ausgesprochen. Ein Schelm, wer Böses dabei denkt. Naja, und wie war das mit dem Richter, Manfred? Ja, vielleicht sollte man noch dazu sagen, wir haben alle Parteien natürlich befragt, kurz vor der Wahl. Und interessanterweise haben sich so manche Parteien, die sich als links oder links stehend ausgeben, bei den Bürgerrechten ziemlich taub oder sind schon im Liegen umgefallen. Ähm, wir können euch jetzt nur einen kleinen Ausschnitt in den wenigen Minuten geben, was wir schon in den 400, äh, bald 200 Sendungen gemacht haben. Das aktuellste Interview in der letzten Sendung war ein, unser, ein gewisser Richter in Salzburger Landesgericht, betreibt eine Seite namens Internet for Jurists und wir haben über alles Mögliche gesprochen, auch über die 
Tierschützer und über Paragraph 278, aber die interessanteste Forderung ist von ihm, äh, er fordert die Imsi-Catcher unter Arrest, also unter richterlicher Kontrolle. Warum und weshalb, ähm, sollte man sich vielleicht anhören. Ja, vielleicht liegt es einfach daran, dass er also auch die Seltenheit von Lawinenunglücken in Wien einfach so äh, sieht, weil das war ja immer mal der Grund, äh, Imsi-Catcher überhaupt anzuschaffen zur Ortung eben von potenziellen Opfern, Lawinenopfern. Also die höchste Imsi-Catcher-Dichte gibt es offensichtlich in Wien. Und äh, immer mal fragen wir Leute, die nach Wien gekommen sind, äh, dass, okay, so viel sind es dann, ähm, ob sie denn schon mal das eine oder andere Lawinenunglück gesehen haben. Ja, wir haben also in 2006, glaube ich, war der Easter Hack in Wien. Da hattest du genau wen äh, interviewt? Ja, den Mr. Chaos Radio himself, Tim Pritloff, war eine große Ehre, immer mein Studio zu haben und wir haben natürlich über die Geschichte über Chaos Radio befragt, nur um ein bisschen die Bandbreite zu zeigen. So, eins zurück. So, und jetzt dann noch ein paar Highlights zum Schluss. Ja, interessant. Also in Wien, Maria F. wurde beim Edelitaliener die Handtasche mit zwei Diensthandys geklaut und das ganze, äh, diese ganze Geschichte beim Edelitaliener hatte natürlich eine Videoüberwachung. Der Täter ist bis heute nicht äh, gefasst. Ja, was zeigt, dass die Überwachung in Österreich perfekter ist? Ja, das österreichische Parlament hat äh, schon seit einem Jahr das sogenannte Sicherheitspolizeigesetz. Äh, nur noch ganz Kurzfassung, also die haben das schon ja, wir bekommen es jetzt, weil es sei heute unterschrieben worden, das BKA-Gesetz. Stattdessen gibt es in Österreich noch keine Vorratsdatenspeicherung, keinen Beschluss dazu, den wir natürlich seit einem Jahr offiziell in Deutschland haben. Gut, mehr Infos zu Bürgerrechten und Überwachung aus Europa. Jeden Freitag on Air auf Radio Orange in Wien, also auf 94.0 und auch als Livestream regelmäßig eben zwischen 13 bis 14 Uhr und selbstverständlich im Sendungsarchiv auch äh, im Internet. Einen letzten Satz noch. Es gibt, ich bin froh, dass es diesen Event hier gibt, der sich immer als international anstreicht. Äh, wir reden aber oft über die deutschen Probleme. Die paar Beispiele, die wir aufgezeigt haben, sollen zeigen, dass Österreich oft ähm, vorprescht mit etwas, was dann später in Deutschland kommt. Vielen Dank. Thanks for the insights in the Austrian security state. And um, tune into uh, Radio Netwatcher if you want to hear more. Now Carl talks about pan spectrocism And uh, the stage is yours, Carl. Go ahead. Sismus oh, in German, maybe. I don't know. I wish my German was better. I, um, I will... Um, is that the... Uh, There we go. Anyway, my, call, my name is Carl Palmas. I'm a uh, sociologist um, of some description, and I'm doing a research project currently about uh, contemporary modes of surveillance. Um, we often hear this uh, Orwellian expression that Big Brother is watching you, and that's uh, something that we always come back to when we talk about surveillance. Um, and we feel, me and my uh, colleague Christopher, who's sitting here, uh, that maybe that uh, idea is not always working especially in the light of current debates on uh, surveillance that we've had back home in Sweden recently. We have to ask ourselves questions like exactly what is being watched and um, what does watching entail? Uh, so for instance, I mean, it's not so much in the recent debates about the FRA bill as we've had in Sweden that it's not so much us as individuals that are being watched. It's a lot more about the inputs of our minds that are being watched and registered in various ways. Um, in terms of what is being, uh, what watching is entailing, um, it's more and more along the lines of rendering our probable futures visible in various ways. Uh, you would see this in what um, intelligence agencies are doing, but you would also see it in big business, uh, trying to come up with various ways of, like airlines knowing which people to upgrade in order for, to, for them to not choose another airline next time. So these are the kinds of new modes of surveillance that are um, evolving. Um, one old way of looking at what surveillance would be is this old Jeremy Bentham uh, notion of the panopticon. Uh, like a, a human being looking at you as an individual. Whereas now we see a lot more um, types of surveillance that are closer to what Manuel de Landa, a philosopher, calls the panspectron. Um, monitoring of any kind of uh, anything um, 
all the kind of electronic traces that we leave uh, behind. Um, so in that way, being panspectric in the sense of all electromagnetic um, uh, activity, not only the visible light that a human eye can see. Um, there are three ways of looking at, or three um, uh, technological developments here, uh, obviously. Uh, first one, that more and more of our um, analog behaviors are being logged in various ways and turned into digital data. Uh, we call this universal modulation. Uh, the second one is the greater storage capacity, and the third one would be data mining, data mining capabilities that are increasing. Um, so instead of saying that Big Brother is watching you, it's more likely that you would think that Big Brother, whoever that is, whether it's a big corporation or a uh, state, um, knows you and probably knows you better than you know yourself. Um, anyway, I won't uh, keep you for longer than this. Um, you can read more on this website. Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. So we are coming through the next speaker, Christopher. You're talking about a magazine? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Christopher Kallenberg, and I'm the editor and publisher of the Resistance Studies magazine. And uh, it's available for free downloads on rsmag.org. And the magazine uh, consists of uh, articles concerning resistance practices and so social change in, in a very general and theoretical and an empirical way. So uh, it's a peer-reviewed magazine and here is a kind of a flow chart for uh, the peer review process. Uh, and thanks to the internet, we are able to have a very short peer review cycle. So we feel very enabled by this new technology. So we publish shorter articles between 2,000 and 4,000 words and also book reviews and we are an open access magazine and we are a member of the director of open access journals uh, which we find very important for uh, making social science and humanities uh, to spread uh, worldwide. But there is a problem and this problem is very serious. Uh, at least that's my opinion because with the internet and internet publication, there comes internet surveillance. So for a magazine like the Resistance Studies magazine, which deals with kind of controversial issues sometimes, activism, resistance, maybe even terrorism, it will be impossible for us to guarantee that the authors will be anonymous in the future. And the Swedish case is, I would say, the most important aspect is the FRA law, which is a law that uh, allows the state to copy all traffic data from that is passing the national borders. And this one will be effective on the 1st of January. So I would say that this will make critical research uh, less attractive for academics. And as we have heard on this conference and also in the media, there will be a fear of that there will be similar cases to Andre Holm, uh, who was arrested for doing exactly what we are trying to publish. Uh, this, from a philosophical point of view, uh, leads to bad science. That's my argument. Because if nobody dares to research controversial topics anymore, nobody dares to go out and look what happens in the streets where activists are protesting or something like that, it will lead to bad science because this will leave a, you know, a black hole in the domain of knowledge. And it's not, the future doesn't look very good because we have in Sweden at least, and you already have this in, in Germany, we will uh, be uh, having this data retention law will be brought up in the parliaments uh, this spring. Uh, we have the IPRED1 directive, which has been almost passed in the parliament, and the IPRED2 directive is also uh, coming closer. 
And so my conclusion is just uh, that I want to publish your academic articles on digital resistance because you are the experts on resistance on the net. And in what Carl was talking about, if in these panspectric societies we also need to cooperate to protect this sensitive information. And my conclusion to maybe this conference is that hacking is a form of resistance. Thank you very much. Uh, Christopher, thank you very much. So today we are widening our attention to Austria and Sweden. Uh, can't be a mistake. So the next speaker is Michiel. He talks about the funding. So, uh, funding. I thought you did it before the. Yeah, so we still have time, relax. Okay. Everybody keep keep the four minutes. So thanks to the magic of the networks, the file will <laughs> Okay, then if it's on the stick, let's copy it onto the laptop. There is a stick already in here. Yeah, so okay. can I plug this or can I? No, it's here also. Well, it's, it's nice to see one. I haven't seen one in a long while. Where is the file? Yeah. Where is the Datei? You have them right out? Ah, okay, okay, okay. System normal, all fucked up. I'll, I'll do it without. Um, basically, I work for a funding agency called Anelnet. Um, uh, we're just a pile of money that came from selling an ISP. The ISP doesn't exist anymore, uh, but the money does. And basically, uh, what we try to do is fund the kind of things that you do. So we, we fund a lot of developments like Tor, Freenet, GNUnet, and other sorts. Uh, anything that is network related is eligible, uh, but we also do a lot of privacy related stuff, uh, open document format, uh, instant messaging. Uh, so basically, there may be. Could you put my name? Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a big long name. It's like. Yeah. Whatever. Continue. Yeah. So um, if there's uh, uh, people among you that uh, have had a good idea for the last couple of years and, and didn't come to actually spending the time to do it, why don't you take six months off? Uh, 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 contact us, ask for money, get it, and, and start programming. So, uh, all that's uh, the URL to visit is nlnet.nl. We're a, a Dutch-based organization, uh, but we operate on a global, uh, on a global scale. Uh, we can fund projects easily up to 30,000 euros. If you're requiring more, we can go uh, qu quite significantly up, but then we have other procedures. If you just need some hardware for hacking, like uh, if you want to hack some Wi-Fi cards or routers or whatever, that is eligible, travel costs and so on. Um, and it's a very easy and, and no-hassle procedure where we can be completely anonymous even if, 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 if you really need it because we're, we're not a government institute, we're a, a private trust fund, so a charity. So, and meanwhile, there's uh, still no progress. So forget the slides; they will be up on the web, on the wiki, I guess. And uh, if you want, uh, if you want, if you're either a student looking for a summer job, but you don't want a Google code thing, uh, or if you if you just fell unemployed, or you just had a great idea but you don't have the time to do it, uh, uh, well, contact me. I'll be available throughout the rest of the night, I guess. Okay, thanks.
All right. Okay, we have one more talk there. Uh, it's the one talk that was missing this morning. So Steve will will do this just now. We are pretty much on time. We have 30 minutes left, so five more minutes here. If you, if there's anyone else in here who would like to give a talk, please sit, come up here and sit in front. Ah, we missed you. Okay. Hi, my name is Steve. I'm the co-founder of uh, Syndicate, a uh, hackerspace in uh, Luxembourg. Thanks for, uh, to Swan for having me because we were a bit late. The Fonolit party yesterday was great. Um, no time to lose, only four minutes left. Um, Luxembourg, what is Luxembourg? Luxembourg is one of the smallest countries in Europe. We have 480k people, so 400,000 people live in Luxembourg. What is Luxembourg? It used to be steel, now it is banks. Banks, big money, and obviously we need a hackerspace. Um, <laughs> crisis, what crisis? It's a great album by the Supertramp. So yeah, what happens in a crisis where all the banks go bankrupt? Luxembourg, theoretically at least, would go bankrupt as well. So shouldn't we actually focus on innovation and on things like hackerspaces? Um, engaging in politics, one of the things we thought was, wh why not engage in politics? Why don't go the po political route to build up a hackerspace? We didn't do that. We didn't think that would be appropriate. So we, we, we tend to stay political neutral. Um, who are we? That's the initial bunch of people that are building the hackerspace. In the middle we have a girl, which is really, really important to us, to get as many people as possible from different aspects of life. Girls are very beneficial to get attention on things. They have a different mindset than guys, believe me. Um, funding. Very, very important. We are in a recession and we need money. If you call up Cisco and say, hi, I'm Steve, I'm from the hackerspace, give me money, they say, no, bugger off. So we need to think about something else. Press coverage, very important too. Um, a, one of the biggest, in Luxembourg at least, IT newspapers published an article about us. Uh, we go to conferences and uh, we sit around with Club Mate and just telling people about us. Uh, we need more people, people that network together, people that actually work with us. Social links. In Luxembourg, 480,000 people, small country, so you have a lot of links. You can't go and take a leak next doors without the neighbor knowing it. So it's very tricky, actually. Um, the hurdle, in Luxembourg at least, a place to stay, slash home. Why? It's 12 euro a square meter in Luxembourg, so if you need... If you need um, 100 square meter for a hacker space, it's really expensive. We have a Facebook group, of course, and we are actually looking into Facebook issues, uh, privacy issues mainly. What do we do? We uh, have a site up surveillance.mallory.lu with the uh, help of open street maps. We try to map out Luxembourg City with all the publicly viewed cameras. Uh, we take a look into RFID things, the ego pass for public transport, uh, the uni.lu uh, pass for the canteen. Uh, so yeah, that's um, the RF idiot. We have created a graffiti research, research lab in Luxembourg to combine actually IT with arts because they go really, really great together. I, know, I think you know all the, um, the great projects uh, from GRL. Um, okay, cool. Marketing. Marketing is very important as well. As you have seen, we have put up a couple of things uh, here in uh, the conference as well. We have a poster, we have uh, stickers, we also have um, stickers which you can put onto windows, which you can take off. Because if you try to uh, convince the mayor of Luxembourg that you are a cool group and you do graffitis on the walls, they're not going to like it. So we try uh, to focus on these things. We try also to focus on the environment to actually um, think about the environment. So all the things politicians actually want uh, to hear. We create synergies because if we have a hackerspace, we can invite other people into the hackerspace, which is also a benefit if you go up to um, the local council and you tell them, hey, we, are, we need a 100 square meter and actually a lot of other uh, people can uh, benefit from it. Uh, thanks uh, for listening. This is a motivation to other people to go out and do stuff, go out 
and build not only hacker spaces, but also engage in uh, political uh, rallies, in demos like we had one next door, uh, do flash mobs, uh, do whatever you like, just enjoy it. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for that, yes. Create more hackerspaces, dudes. So, one more talk there. Anyone else? Come up here and let us know. Uh, I think after the next talk, well, we would have almost to conclude it. Um, but p please remember, give us some feedback, and I hope to see you tomorrow on Saal 2, on Room 2 at 11.30 for some more talks. And maybe next year we might take it to the next level. We would like to have like, uh, somebody helping us taking a picture and putting it online right away uh, so we don't have to do it overnight while we're actually partying, right? So uh, don't forget uh, to take another look at the wiki. There's a page on parties and there's several parties tonight. Of course, tomorrow evening there will be the uh, final party at the Seabase. Be there and uh, give us some f feedback. And yes, I w we would very much uh, like to welcome more lightning talks. So if you can put up your lightning talk even earlier in the wiki, we might even get a little more time. So there's another talk. I don't know who we are. Please introduce yourself. Right. Hi, I'm, I'm Luciano. Um, uh, Few year, a few days ago, uh, I woke up with an idea, so I want to, to tell you about this. Um, happens to me that uh, I have many servers in my home. Uh, one of those servers are a honeypot. Um, so uh, in the firewall, uh, many connections need to be forwarded to that honeypot. Uh, one of those ports are the 22, the SSH because I run a honeypot for SSH. Uh, so I have the problem to need to enter to my service by SSH too, but not to the honeypot. So I write few bash scripts to redirect uh, dynamically um, the connections uh, with uh, the origin in my source, with the origin in the computer, where am I in the remote place to the to that server where we we are, I want to go. Yes, in 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 plain words, uh, I just connect to a to a to a page who who see which is my IP and create dynamically a firewall rule to directly to redirect all the packages to a selected server in my home. In that uh, in that in this way, uh, I can use only one port. Uh, to connect to many of my servers just with one click. The idea is to just do a sync package to, to, to this home page, and in that case, the, the rule is generated dynamically. Uh, that's what I call uh, web knocking. It's like port knocking, but with web. <laughs> um, I, have, uh, I, I implement this in OpenBSD, but the idea can be used for, for every operating system. The interface is in ASCII art, so you can, uh, you can see it by, I don't know, making a telnet, uh, or you, you don't need a browser, you just do that with a connection with telnet, yes? Uh, that's, that's the idea, this is the homepage. The, it's my name, lucianovesho.com.ar. Uh, slash web knocking. Uh, maybe you can you can use it. Have some Python and some shell scripting. Uh, it's a really stupid idea, but I don't know. Maybe you, you would like it. You like it. stupid things. So. <laughs> hmm? So this was the third session of the Lightning Talks at the 25th KS Communication Congress. Tomorrow at 11.30 in room number two, that will be the fourth and last. Uh, I want to uh, get the speakers all up so we can give a big applause for this entertaining and informative uh, talk. So get up. <laughs> so.
So, all, uh, you can find all the information on the wiki page, so the web addresses, all the email addresses, some even put their slides on, so contact them if you want. Go ahead.